one. And we welcome you back to, we welcome you back to the hashtag, I'm sorry, the Shake Back Sports Show right here on the Big Game Christian Sports Network. Man, I just got done listening to the hashtag, Brothers of Baseball. Twelves and Sixes Monday through Friday with your boy, Willie Epting Jr. As we are amidst the playoffs in the majors, man. Um, before we go any further in this second segment, it is being brought to you by the Big Game Christian Sports Network. That's right. Still in a pandemic. Was the NBA bubble a success? Calls for justice still ring out and a presidential election to remember. That's just some of the things to expect as we once again come together to kick the narrative for a third time live Saturday, November 14th at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time live on Facebook at BGC Sports One. And yes, we absolutely want you to comment and ask questions as well. Let's kick the narrative part three, Saturday, November 14th, 3 p.m. CST. Uh, live on Facebook, BGC Sports 1, right here on the BGC Sports Network. All right, coming to the stage, man. I am so excited to have this gentleman uh, come on. He is a part of the Dallas Cowboys flagship station, 105.3 The Fan. He actually is also the CEO, creator of is, is Clutch Sports, right, Kevin? Kevin Gray Sports now. Kevin Gray yeah. Sports. Okay, yeah, went through a little bit of a rebrand. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he went through a rebrand. Once Club Sports, now Kevin Gray uh, Sports. And that is none other than Kevin Gray Jr. himself. Kevin, what's going on, man? What's going on, man? I appreciate you having me on. I know it's it's been a while since we've had a chance to converse a little bit, but I appreciate the invitation and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and uh, I look forward to it as well. And um, there's something that I want to play uh, that I heard <laughs> that I heard in the realm of social media on Tuesday. And um, tell me if this voice sounds familiar to you. Hold All on right. one quick second. I'm going to play this real quick. These players aren't good enough. Daryl Worley, Darian Thompson, and plenty of others are not good enough to be on this football team playing the way that they've been playing over the first four weeks of a season. And you expect to be this much better going forward. Stephen Jones says that the players to make this thing better are currently in the room. Where are they? Where are they, Kevin? <laughs> That's it. You tell me, because I, I don't know where they are. Uh, look, Yes, that is me uh, ranting and raving on the Dallas Cowboys in their one and three start after getting their tail whooped by the uh, the Cleveland Browns uh, at home on high noon in front of 25,000 people. A new COVID record, by the way, for Jerry Jones in uh, AT&T Stadium. But at the same time, yeah, we've heard a lot about Stephen Jones, the COO of the Dallas Cowboys, saying that the players – to make this thing turn around from their one and three start are currently in the room. And I'm just wondering where are they? Because Darian Thompson, Xavier Woods, Daryl Worley, among others have been terrible these first four weeks of the season to the tune of giving up nearly 37 points per game. So I just had a question, you know, if they, if they're supposed to be in the room, I don't know where they are because what we've seen through the first four weeks it doesn't give any indication to me that there are players good enough in that locker room as currently constructed on this football team to turn this thing around to give us an idea that they can improve their secondary. And when you mention the word or the the, the name Daryl Worley, uh, he came over from the Raiders. They should have asked the scrap heap. <laughs> yeah, they, they, should, they should have asked me before signing that kid because um, I would not have been an advocate for him to become a cowboy. Uh, a defensive uh, person or, or player on, on that in that secondary because he, um, to put it lightly and to put it politely, he was just not very good. <laughs> not very good. That's about the nicest I've heard it put over the first four weeks of the season, quite honestly. Uh, I mean, these cats are barbecue chicken. Every time you get out there every single Sunday, you saw what happened. Odell Beckham, you know, <laughs> who really hadn't been a factor for Cleveland much this season you know, catches a 37 yard touchdown from Jarvis Landry. And you're just looking around at, you know, Darian Thompson getting caught looking in the backfield. Then Odell Beckham catches another touchdown pass and he basically freezes Daryl Worley, you know, at the line stutter steps on him. And next thing you know, it's another touchdown. So I just, it, it amazes me that the Cowboys have looked around to see the success of other football teams, teams like the Pittsburgh Steelers with Mika Fitzpatrick. 
the Kansas City Chiefs with Tyron Matthew and Juan Thornhill and other teams that you could name that have really good secondary play, especially in the back half. And to think that they have not invested in this position really since the days of Darren Woodson. You're in a passing league in 2020. Teams are throwing the football at a record pace this year specifically, and yet the Cowboys looked around and said, yep, we got the guys in the room right now that could get this thing done. No, you don't. And I guess part of the rest of the video was, you know, I said, look, I'm tired of the Cowboys playing you and I for stupid. (laughs) You see what's going on. I see what's going on. The rest of Cowboys Nation and the rest of these people who support the team, they see what's going on, and they're there's a lot of folks that are tired of Jerry and Steven Jones looking at us and trying to tell us what we don't see on the football field when clearly we know what's going on here. The players aren't good enough and it has to change. And and I want to jump on that point when you said that they did not address the secondary issues, of course, you know, losing Byron Jones to the Miami dolphins. I think it looms larger than cowboy fans probably wanted to admit Um, was he in in, an elite corner? I don't think he was an elite corner, but he was way better than what they have now. Two times, three times over. But when you, when you grab CeeDee Lamb at the 17th pick, I understand the, the methodology of grabbing the best player on the board. And they've always said is they, they've always told us that you don't build your team through the draft. You build your team through free agency. Um, or you address your needs in free agency and you build your team through the draft. Uh, they need some building in that secondary. Why did they <laughs> not take one of these guys, man, That's uh, that was on the board? Well, I, I was fine with the pick at 17 for CeeDee Lamb because when you look at the strength of this football team, it's on the offensive side of the football. And when you have not only the best player available that can situate a strength for a football team that's got – one of the better quarterbacks in the National Football League, you go ahead and take that guy. Now, if they had taken Caleb on chase on, it would have made sense at the time for them to take him. Uh, but what we've seen from him so far this season, he hasn't really performed up to the kind of status that we thought he had coming into the draft. So I feel even better now about not just the way CeeDee Lamb has played through the first four weeks, but the reasons why they decided to go get him. I guess for me, there are plenty of options, it seems like, out in free agency, uh, hello, Earl Thomas, uh, that could potentially help this team, but the Cowboys just simply refuse to go down that road. So I think when you look at what Stephen Jones, Will McClay, and others thought that they had, look, I was fine with the pick with Trevon Diggs in the second round, one of the best corners still available at the time, and you know rookies are going to make mistakes in the secondary. It's just the nature of the game. You don't like to see him struggle as much as he has so far, but There are flashes of other things that you've seen from him, namely the play against DK Metcalf where he tracked him down after getting burnt for, you know, 62 yards and still hustled to make the play to knock the ball out of the end zone. Those are the kinds of positive signs that you think, you know what, he's going to get it eventually. So I'm not necessarily, you know, going to bang on Trevon Diggs too, you know, so much, but these other dudes, when you look at Jordan Lewis, yeah, I know he was hurt coming into the season, hasn't played all that much, but Xavier Woods, Daryl Worley, let me ask you a question. (laughs) <laughs> how bad did ha ha Clinton Dix have to be to get cut off this football team? A guy who was a, supposed to be a veteran leader coming in to, you know, play with Mike McCarthy in green Bay, you know, had some, you know, quality time in the national football league. That dude got cut from the secondary. So it just tells you how porous the secondary really was that ha ha Clinton Dix couldn't even survive the room in Dallas. So it's just a matter of finding better talent, to be able to help this team be better, not to mention the biggest problem to me now, the first few weeks was, all right, you can torch in the passing game. That is what it is at this point right now. But against Cleveland, you got physically whooped at the, at the line of scrimmage to the tune of 307 yards. Now that's a problem because it's one thing to get beat when your identity is, you know what, this is a bad defense in terms of its secondary. Now your front seven is out here getting beat the way that they did Jalen Smith played poorly, the defensive line, the front four for them played poorly. And to me, that's more concerning now going forward because that's a mentality and a physical problem. You can deal with mental mistakes every now and then a busted coverage every now and then what you can't have is getting physically dominated at the line of scrimmage to the point where basically they made you quit until your quarterback brought you back to the football game. So that to me is really concerning. when you start looking at the Cowboys going forward. And I, I could go so many different angles or take that at so many different angles. Once again, Willie Upton Jr. 
on the Shake Back Sports Show right here on the BGC Sports Network, kicking it with Kevin Gray of Kevin Gray Sports as well as 105.3 ESPN. No, not ESPN. That's that's um, that's the uh, that's the other <laughs> station. The, yeah, fan, the, the fan 105.3, the flagship station of the Dallas Cowboys, and we're talking about those Cowboys and the rant that he's on. But I want to <laughs> I want to I want to pose this to you, um, Demarcus Lawrence. I mean, where are you? I mean, when you have a guy by the name of Alden Smith who played for the Raiders, he didn't do anything there. We know what he did when he was in San Francisco, but he hasn't been in the NFL ranks playing any type of football anywhere for the last five years. Comes in off the streets, and he's leading the league in sacks. And your defensive end, who you just signed to a mega extension, we have an APB out for him. Explain And that's the enigma with DeMarcus Lawrence, right? Because this is a guy who, as you mentioned, is getting paid over $20 million a season. And for what he does, for what he's getting paid, you want more production. Now, you can see through last year and this year so far, he's been really good against the run. He was probably the best run defender other than Joe Thomas that the Cowboys had on Sunday this past week against the Cleveland Browns. At the same time, I don't pay DeMarcus Lawrence over $20 million to go and be in the run game and to play as consistently as he does in the run game. I don't pay him for that. I pay him to go get after the quarterback. We say, Kevin, he helped make Robert Quinn a lot better last year to get after the quarterback had a double digit sack season. Yeah. He got money with by the Chicago bears and now is getting paid, you know, by them to go sack the quarterback. And now, as you mentioned, Alden Smith comes in a guy who hadn't played a down of football in four in five years at the time was leading the NFL in sacks. So DeMarcus Lawrence makes helps make plays for others and is good in the run game. But at the same time, it cannot be this when you're getting paid over $20 million and people have told me, Kevin, that's real low hanging fruit, man. That's easy to bang on a dude who's getting paid over $20 million because he's not sacking the quarterback. Well, guess what? The Cowboys told you and I that he was worth over $20 million when he had 25 sacks in two years, a couple of years, you know, a few seasons ago. So that means this is a guy you pay as if he's going to get after the quarterback in that way. And he just simply doesn't do it anymore. Great in the Warner game does get after the quarterback and the way that this defensive line has played so far this year, I need my man to get after the quarterback and put the guy on the ground. Cause so far it's not happening for him. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I think, you know, for this Cowboys specifically on the defensive side, there's so many holes. There's no pass rush. They're missing, uh, Leighton Van Der Esch is going to be out for the next, what, six weeks or so. Um, how much of this do we put on defensive coordinator Mike Nolan? A lot. <laughs> A lot. I told folks coming in this year, when they hired Mike Nolan, I said, look, these Mike Nolan defenses now, they're going to give up a bunch of yards in between the 20s, but they're going to force turnovers, and they usually bend but not break when it comes to the red zone. They've gotten broken now for the last the last four weeks. And that's not necessarily characteristic of Mike Nolan defenses. So folks have said, Kevin, you've been in, a, they've been in the middle of a pandemic. Learning a complicated scheme is much more difficult when you don't have the OTAs and the practices and the full training camp that you're accustomed to having. And I say, forget all of that. It's four weeks into the season at this point. And the terminology that these players are learning, you're asking them to do some different things, but it shouldn't be to the tune of giving up five touchdown passes to Russell Wilson to the tune of giving up 307 yards on the ground to getting screened game to death by the Los Angeles Rams in week one. And then Matt Ryan and Calvin Ridley went to town on you. And if Julio Jones doesn't drop a touchdown pass against Trevon Diggs, that football game is over. And we're talking about a team that's really 0-4. So Mike Nolan, look, he had not been a defensive coordinator for quite some time. I believe four or five years it had been since he had been a defensive coordinator. But you know what? Your boy, Mike McCarthy, was hired by him when he was back in San Francisco as an offensive coordinator. So Mike McCarthy said, you know, I'm going to return the favor for my guy and Mike Nolan. And so far, it hasn't worked out the way that it needs to. And they refuse to make a change there, which I can understand not making a change four games in. But some of the stuff has to get corrected. If you get to the midpoint of the season and these things are still happening and the only consistent thing in the room other than the players is the head coach in the scheme, yeah, you might need to make a change and shift some things around because it can't be this going into future games against teams like the Steelers, the Arizona Cardinals that they'll see on Monday night in a couple of weeks, the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. Like it can't it can't be that by the time you get to those kinds of games. Yeah. And as we have about 
three minutes left to go in this in this segment. Uh, I want to give you two minutes to talk about Dak, and then at the end of the segment, give out all of your information, how you can be followed, contact, listen to, or whatever. Um, but as far as Dak Prescott goes, uh, well, let me get to this because one of my co-hosts on the ha- hashtag Rose of Baseball show, uh, she is a Cleveland Browns fan, and of course, you can tell by that she is <laughs> ecstatic. And I'm talking about my uh, hashtag Sissy of Baseball, Natalie Turk. But as far as Dak goes. Dak has shown that he deserves the the contract that that's a long term deal. I'm not saying he gets he should get Patrick Mahomes money, but he's definitely worth in that you know 35 to 38 million dollar a year range. How much of this, from the offensive standpoint, do you think could be fool's gold with the fact that he's throwing the ball all over the place and is racking up all these numbers? And they've got some running back from Ohio State. I think his name is uh, Zeke or, or Zach or, or something. <laughs> yeah, Ezekiel Elliott. He's not been getting the ball. So in, in about a minute and a half or less, should Dak be considered possibly the problem, but even though he's playing so very well? No, I, I don't consider the consider him the problem. You say, well, now he's taken a couple of sacks he shouldn't have taken, you know, a couple of turnovers that he's had that have put the Cowboys in bad positions. Yeah, I understand that. But at the same time, the reason why you're not 0-4 is because Rain Dakota Prescott is out here keeping you in football games. They had no business coming back against Atlanta. They sure as heck had no business coming back against Cleveland. And the only reason why is because number four is out here throwing it all over the lot. A man's on pace to throw the ball for over 6,700 yards. It's kind of insane. You say, Kevin, well, they had to come from behind a lot in order to throw off for all those yards. Yeah, I understand that. But just imagine once this offense gets on track, quits turning the football over and let this man play from a lead. Now you get to really dictate the kind of pace that you want to with the up-tempo game that he likes to play. So I don't consider Dak Prescott the problem in this particular you know, scenario. But at the same time, I understand where some folks would level some blame on him because of some of the turnover issues. But the only reason why you're not 0 4 is Dak Prescott has kept you from being 0 4 at this point. Yeah. And let me, let me just chime in real quick before we actually come to the end of the segment. Uh, when I say Dak Prescott being the problem, not really so much in the fact that he's, pl- you know, the sacks that you mentioned, I don't, I'm not taking any of that into consideration. I'm just talking in terms of the success that he's had and now the offense may be going, uh, leaning more towards throwing the ball over the rock instead of handing the ball to Zeke uh, in the I formation or what have you to get that running game established. All right, Kevin, uh, social media information, go. Appreciate it, man. Uh, You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Kevin Gray Sports. And uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel also at Kevin Gray Sports. And you can catch me on the weekends on Saturdays and Sundays on 105 Through the Fan and uh, filling in for our guys from time to time. All right. So there he is. And there he goes, man. Appreciate your time. Uh, We're going to get you back on because I have so many other questions, man. (laughs) Uh, So that's going to wind it down for the second segment of the Shake Back Sports Show here on the Big Game Christian Sports Network. Y'all come on back on the other side of the break. We're going to get into some more NFL football. So come on back and uh, it's going to be good. I promise.